Hey guys, welcome back. I just finished watching episode 2 of the Halo TV show called Unbound, and we need to talk about it because this was a weird episode. As with the last Brutally Honest video about the Halo TV show, these are just my thoughts that I threw onto paper whilst I was watching it, my immediate thoughts to everything that happened in this episode, which was definitely a filler episode, may I add. Um, not much happened in this, so I'm hoping that the pace kind of picks back up again in episode 3, because episode 1 kind of set a good precedent for the overall pace of the, of the show, and this felt like they kind of slammed the brakes on a little bit. So I think that in this show, they really need to start laying off having Chief not wearing his helmet. I'm perfectly fine with them having him take his helmet off every now and then to really strike an important emotional note or to show a certain emotion in a certain way, but half if not more of this episode was just Chief walking around with no helmet on and in some cases no armor either, which felt very disconnected from his character. I don't like this idea that to characterize and to humanize Chief, you have to take his helmet off. Halo 3, Halo 4, and Halo Infinite all showed perfectly that you don't need to do that. That's a massive misconception, and I'm really hoping that as we go further through the episodes and also go into Season 2, they kind of lay off with this because it's making the Chief not really feel like the Chief. It's ironic because in a regular canon, blue team, who are essentially the silver team in this canon, are the ones who have their helmets off quite frequently, whereas Chief contrasts them by basically never taking it off. Whereas in this universe, silver team have had their helmets on far more than Chief has. It seems like it's kind of flipped up the wrong way. I think as well, Chief and Sorin's first meeting on the rubble would have been like a thousand times more impactful and also more demonstrative of how the UNSC have conditioned Chief, which was kind of the whole genesis of Sorin's character and what he did at the start of the episode, if Chief had kept his helmet on. It would have shown the stark difference between the Spartan who finally embraced freedom and the Spartan who is still conditioned by the UNSC. Although I will say, Pablo Schreiber does a really good job at still trying to convey the kind of robotic-like personality of a Spartan with his helmet off, like using his face and the way that he talks. He definitely conveys that still. I just don't think the helmet needs to be off this much. Going back to Soren's character, I think he's a bit too light and fluffy in the TV show. So in Pariah, and also to a degree in this show, Sauron is absolutely messed up, right? What he goes through during the augmentations for the Spartan 2 absolutely destroys him, both physically and also mentally. So to see him in this show with like a wife and kid just like casually smoking clarity, which I'm assuming is like the Halo Universe's version of weed or something like that, just seems a little bit off character. Granted, it is 22 years later, so a lot of time has passed, but even then, I feel like what Soren went through as a kid with a Spartan program would not be something that you just casually shake off like that. I just think he should have been more of like a Doomer character and less of like a chill, happy family life kind of guy, but I will say Bokeem Woodbine plays him really well. Uh, I enjoyed his performance, and again, that's my kind of thought with this TV show overall. The acting and the performances are all fantastic. My issue is more so where the script is taking those characters. I thought the rubble looked, to be honest with you, visually incredible. It was almost exactly how I pictured it, reading the Cole Protocol, which is great. I do find it a bit weird how they used a Covenant door sound effect for a UNSC door, not like it's an important fact. They could have just said that, oh, when the insurrectionists built the rubble in this universe, they stole some Covenant tech and stole some of their door tech or something. Just a bit weird to hear that, although I will be, I will be honest, it was very cool to hear that sound effect. Like I said, it's the little small details like that that make stuff for me, so it is appreciated. And the VFX for the Pelican scene, when Chief and Quan pop out of split space and are flying through the rubble field, was really good. It was leagues ahead of the CGI in episode one, which is very reassuring. But what wasn't reassuring is what they seem to be doing to the whole Reclaimer law in this show. By the sounds of it, as this episode is set up, only a few select humans can interact, at least with the Keystone, maybe other foreign artifacts as well. And they're referred to as Blessed Ones. Now, I'm assuming they're going to go down the route of having these Blessed Ones, these Blessed Humans, notably Master Chief and Marquis, have particular Geishas inside of them that allows them to interact with a foreign attack. But that uproots the very core of what humanity are in the Halo universe. They are the rightful heirs of the mantle of responsibility and what all the foreigners left behind, which is why they are the only species in the galaxy that can interact with their artifacts. I really hope they don't uproot that very core of Halo's canon 
just to create like a ham-fisted plot device to put Marquis against Chief and have them have some sort of connection, even though they're on very opposite sides of the war. I can see them doing that and going that route, and I really hope they don't. We also learned that this artifact, the Keystone, is basically like a luminary light. It just points to the direction of a halo ring. Uh, but I'm going to be honest, the artifact for the Keystone, the, the, the prop for the Keystone, sorry, is not great. I noticed this in episode one and also again in this episode. It really looks like it's made out of polystyrene and has like a few like sharpie marks drawn, drawn on it. It doesn't look like an ancient foreign artifact made of ancient foreign alloys that was meant to withstand the test of hundreds of thousands of years. It definitely looks like a very light prop. Right, let's get to the one biggest disappointment of this episode for me. When I heard this name, I was like, dude, yes, let's go. Reth. So if you don't know, Reth was a jackal character from the Cold Protocol. And when Soren said we're going to go see Reth, I was like, dude, yes, we're going to have a jackal character. And they made Reth a human. Ah. <sighs> I will say, credit where it's due, the guy who played Wrath did a really good job at making him just seem crazy. I mean, hell, he literally moved and talked like a jackal, but he was human. I, this, see, this worries me, because it kind of validates my thoughts about what Marquis and the Arbiter might be. The fact that I feel like Marquis is a human character that is replacing the Arbiter story arc, because Arbiter and Elite CGI is expensive. Whereas using a human actress isn't as expensive as animating the entire thing. And I really hope that's not the case. I really hope that Reth being swapped out for a human isn't a sign that the Arbiter has been swapped out for Marquis. I really hope, because this was a disappointment. I will say though, I did like the way that Reth talked about the Halos. He kind of gave them this creepy atmosphere and vibe, which I liked. And also the bit of Halo music that played in the background, the Halo motif, the iconic Halo motif, also was very good because like I said in my last video, not a fan of the soundtrack for this show at all. I think for the most part, it's just forgettable. But that kind of sewn into the, the regular theme was really good. Back to High Charity, I cannot stand how the Prophet's High Sanctum looks. This room just looks silly. It looks way too Art Deco and like, like you've almost tried too hard to make a futuristic species when in fact, what we had in Halo 2 just looked leagues, leagues better and more functional as well. I also don't think that the Prophets seem that distinct from one another either. I found it quite hard to distinguish from all three of them. Again, in Halo 2, Truth, Mercy, and Regret were very distinguishable characters. They looked different, they spoke different, they had different demeanors. Whereas in this, they all kind of just seemed the same. The only difference, of course, was, as one of my friends put it, the Infinity Stones in the back of their chairs were different colors. That was like the only way to differentiate them. There's also no crowns. I wonder why they didn't give them crowns. That's kind of odd. Um, I just hope that in future episodes, they do try and distinguish these three prophets more because obviously in the games and also as well in the expanded universe in the regular canon, Truth, Mercy and Regret are all three very, very different characters. So hopefully they can kind of separate them in the show because this episode did not do a great job at doing that. But I will say that elite that was talking to them, the armor notwithstanding, because I can't stand the way the elite armor looks in this, but the elite himself looked really, really, really good. Straight up like Halo 2 Anniversary Elite, if not more like Halo 2's Elite, which are my personal favorites, even more so than H2A's. So the elite, again, the armor notwithstanding, looked fantastic. We finally got to see Burn Gorman's Vincia Grath in this episode in the flesh, and I gotta say, very, very good. I like the genesis of this character. I feel like he's a character that was made specifically for Burn Gorman, fit him as an actor really well, and he played him perfectly. It looks like this machine pistol that he has here is a little bit similar to the one that you can use in Spartan Strike, I think it was, or Spartan Assault. Uh, although I did look a bit later and it's just like a modified Glock with like two magazines or something, which is a little bit weird. Um, but I will say this madman scene opening with him just executing civilians casually uh, was quite a way to introduce his character formally. Him pretty much being a UNSC plant to control Madrigal's fuel reserves uh, and also to help lower fuel prices across the galaxy was pretty interesting. Um, and it's going to be cool to see how that plot plays out on Madrigal because that is a very kind of like only fuckery kind of plot that I like to see in, in Halo Media. So 
I'm going to be curious to see how that plays out. Something I wasn't a fan of, though, with the Insurrectionists is that the fact that every single one of them now is just being given a modern-day weapon over a Halo Universe weapon, when in the regular Halo Universe, we know for a fact that's not the case. Of course, the odd one will use a modern-day weapon, but broadly speaking, the Innies just use weapons that they've stolen from the UNSC or that they've scavenged from glass planets or from abandoned colonies and stuff like that. So... I don't feel like every single insurrectionist needs to be using an AK or an AR or something like that. You can give them like a BR or a DMR or a shotgun and it would still fit very well within the cannon. I feel like what they're trying to do with this is create a contrast between the insurrectionists being poor and downtrodden by the UNSC and then the UNSC who are very rich, very powerful, very well armed with all the futuristic weapons and stuff like that. And I appreciate that direction, but I don't think it works. And I say that as somebody who was a really big fan of seeing modern weapons in that first episode. I just don't think that every single insurrectionist needs to be using one because it's kind of taking you out of the Halo universe in a way. Halsey's manipulation of Parangoski uh, at that meeting table in this episode was really good. I like how she basically cornered her into agreeing to the Cortana project given that last episode, Parangoski was like, nah, you gotta stop this, you gotta cut this off, get rid of the Flash clone, stop it right now. So her pretty much putting her into a corner and forcing her to agree to her project or risk being embarrassed in front of like the entire UNSC high command was a very cool plot point. I'm still not entirely sure as well if the main motive for Cortana in this show is to control the Spartans, like Halsey says to Parangoski, or if that's just her being deceptive and manipulative again and trying to convince Parangoski to support her program so it furthers her own causes, when in fact that's not the case and she's creating Cortana just to be a perfect AI companion for Chief or for the Spartans. I honestly can't tell if she's being serious with this or if it's just deception, so... I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. I think Lord Hood was fantastic in this episode. It's great to see Hood uh, in the TV show. Also great to see him in Chief's Corner, backing him. Very on brand. Uh, Silver Team, we didn't see him much in this, but still, they look fantastic. But one of the times that we did see them was on the UNSC Stalwart Dawn, which was the frigate that tracked Chief to the rubble. Now, that's a very cool reference to the Cold Protocol, because in that book, Captain Jacob Keyes takes a ship called the Midsummer Night to the rubble, which just so happens to be a stalwart class light frigate. So that was a subtle little reference, little nod to the Cold Protocol, which, like I've said before in videos, has basically formed the entire foundation of the show with the rubble, with the innies, and now with this, which is fantastic. I love that little nod. But then we have the uh, kind of bombshell towards the end, um, and not the bombshell that I think any of us were expecting. Nudity <laughs> in Halo, which is uh, certainly something. I don't think any of us ever expected to see nudity on high charity of all places. Uh, that was certainly an interesting scene. I think that this sign on her back, this like branding, is meant to be the mark of shame again just validates my idea that Marky is a replacement for the Arbiter if she's got his mark of shame it's like okay maybe she is please don't do that I'm begging you show don't replace the Arbiter please don't replace my favorite Halo character please but yeah that was uh, episode two of the Halo TV show a uh, bit of a meh episode to be honest with you uh, really felt like filler and having episode two the second episode of the overall thing be filler probably isn't the best idea. I'm really hoping that the pace picks up again in episode three onwards because I don't want every episode in the middle of the season until like the penultimate episode to be like this because not really much happened in this episode. I just felt like it needed more substance and it also needed less uh, replacing Covenant characters with humans because that's kind of really detracting from the Halo atmosphere. It would have been so cool if when we got to that prison cell, there was actually a jackal in there and we had a, a scene where Chief was talking to a jackal about this artifact, but we didn't. Uh, hopefully that doesn't mean that the Arbiter is not in this, but his plot line is, but who knows, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Uh, if I had to give this episode a rating out of 10, I'd say maybe six out of 10. Uh, it was all right, it was all right. It could have been a lot better, um, but it, I suppose it, could have been worse as well. It was, yeah, it was 6 out of 10. It was alright. So, let me know what you guys thought of the episode down below in the comments. As per usual, uh, later today, I will have a breakdown of the entire episode up on my channel. That will be a bit longer and more in-depth than this. So, make sure you hit that sub button. Uh, turn on the bell and all that typical YouTube crap to make sure you don't miss that video. And I'll catch you later today in the next one. Thank you all for watching. And I'll catch you all in the next one.